All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. We are ready to move on to our second panel. I'm George Foster, uh, professor at the law school. And so this next panel is entitled Food for Thought. What is the optimal IP strategy for cell or plant-based protein? So we're going to have three distinguished IP attorneys who are going to give us a sense of how companies in the sustainable protein space may benefit from IP protection, the optimal ways to approach it, and various pitfalls to avoid. So as a starting point, I think it's worth noting that there are potentially a wide variety of different forms of IP protection that may be relevant to these companies. So for example, if a, com uh, a company comes up with some new alternative protein product, some aspect of the product itself might be patentable or uh, the method that's used to produce it might be, or and, and in fact, there could be multiple patents along the way at any of those stages. Um, and then the same subject matter could potentially be protectable as a trade secret. So a strategic choice is required. Should you keep this as a trade secret? Should you apply for a patent and get this 20 year monopoly, but then um, have it in the um, going into the public? Um, so, um, and then on top of patents and trade secrets, Companies, of course, have to pursue branding for their company and for their products, so trademarks and trade dress may be relevant as well. Uh, and then one other thing to note, just sort of as a foundation for this discussion, is that some of the most cutting edge products in this area involve a merging of two different areas that are normally distinct, so food and life sciences or biotechnology. So each of these areas has traditionally had their own separate approaches to IP. And so we're going to be considering how IP strategy may need to be adjusted in this new emerging hybrid area. So I wanted to just mention how we're going to sort of our format and how we're going to handle Q&A. So we're going to have sort of traditional presentations. We're going to have a dialogue similar to the last panel. And then we're going to reserve time toward the end for Q&A. Uh, but I want to just really emphasize that the panelists are open to questions at any point. If there's something that somebody's talking about, anybody has a question about, feel free to go to your Q&A icon and type in a question. And periodically, I will check the questions and we will, uh, if it's an appropriate time, we'll fit those in. And then otherwise, uh, we may be able to get to them at the the Q&A toward the end. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce our panelists. So uh, one, we have Gaby Longsworth, PhD, who is a director in Stern Kessler's Biotechnology and Chemical Practice Group. She counsels clients from around the world in all areas of patent procurement, particularly in areas such as biotherapeutics, biologics, microbiome, uh, excuse me, microbiome-based technologies and synthetic biology. Gaby earned a PhD in human genetics and molecular biology from John Hopkins and holds a JD from Georgetown Law Center. We also have Jason Novak, who's a partner at Norton Rose Fulbright in San Francisco. He focuses primarily on IP transactions and prosecution, as well as data rights. He specializes in convergence industries such as pre precision medicine, digital health, alternative protein, cultured meat, and advises entities of every size. He's a former engineer with Kraft Foods R&D. Uh, he holds a JD from Chicago Kent College of Law. And finally, we have David Postolsky, who's a senior partner at Gearhart Law in New York, New York. He specializes in assisting investors, creators, startups, entrepreneurs, early stage companies, and emerging companies with their US and international IP strategy, uh, protection, enforcement, monetization. So his involvement in cell-based proteins and, and, and other uh, alt protein sources includes serving as an IP mentor to several industry firms. He's a frequent speaker on IP issues, teaching at Temple University, Parsons School of Design, and Radziner Law School in Herzliya, Israel. Okay, and, uh, and I would just mention that all three of our panelists are registered patent attorneys, although they have expertise in other areas of IP as well. So uh, uh, for the first question, I think it would be, I mentioned that there are sort of these different tr traditional segments uh, where you have food and then you have on the one, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, you have biotech, life sciences. So Jason, if I could ask you, and I know having a background in, 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 at Kraft, 
Could you give, give us a sense of sort of the traditional approach to IP of food companies? Sound check okay? Sounds great. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, uh, George. So yeah, um, typically, when you think about food companies, or when you think about IP strategy, uh, one of the main components of sort of differentiating or choosing between patents and trade secrets, which is often sort of the decision, uh, sort of the decision matrix of what you're considering, a lot of it has to do with how long you believe you can maintain exclusivity. And in the food industry, it's unique in that if, if your product, if you're able to uh, maintain secrecy over your product, particularly its composition, for an extended period of time, you can maintain exclusivity for an extended period of time. Compare this to like the tech industry, which is so uh, transient in its development that um, trade secrets are less valuable because uh, by the time it, is, it, it achieves any sort of commercial value, you've moved on to version two, version three, version four. Let's compare it to like the Oreo cookie formula, the Pepsi formula, which have been in place for decades. So food industry is unique in terms of the ability to maintain exclusivity for a very long time and competitive advantage in industry, which then by definition uh, leads you more down the trade secret route. I add to that the fact that if you look at what is publicly disclosed around a food product, generally speaking, it's an ingredient line, which will tell you what the ingredients are, just not how much of it is in there. And so that is that uh, that forms a nice line for companies to maintain both a combination of patent and trade secret protection, often trade secret protection over their specific formula compositions uh, and the formula percentages, but the ability to claim or patent unique ingredient combinations. And a lot of times what you'll, you, what you'll have is look, if, if, if one ingredient, let's say xanthan gum and some hydrocolloid together work together to have some synergistic textual benefits over a product without claiming the exact percentages of those or the exact percentages of those in combination with the rest of the ingredients in the formula, you can still claim a unique sort of synergy or ratio between the two or something like that that you, you found to have some uh, surprising benefits. Other things you wanna protect on the patent side is, is anything that's publicly facing, so appearance. If there's manufacturing processes that allow you to achieve a certain specific type of appearance, let's look at a great example is chewing gum. It, it, uh, folks, we've seen over the years how the, the appearances of chewing gum have changed. You have layers, you have, you have uh, maybe some different si uh, type of composition inside a, encased in a larger composition. There's manufacturing process and molds necessary to be able to create that uniqueness. That is something you would look to protect. Often in the food industry, you're looking to protect um, the flavor and textual attributes that are valuable and that are brand worthy. So if you're, if, you're, if you're having a unique combination of ingredients that produces some form of umami flavor, something like that, that's very unique to your product, that's something you would look to protect. The same thing when it comes to textual be uh, benefits, maybe some, some, you know, some, uh, some density or thickness that is able to be achieved uniquely because the margins in the food industry are, are very low. So often you're looking for synergistic properties of ingredients in order to achieve a low COGS. But by doing so, you're developing new innovations in, in the process of doing it. So again, what's publicly facing you want to protect, but at the same time, the way ingredient labeling is provided and the way uh, the, the, the ability to maintain exclusivity leads uh, a lot of food industry into the trade secret realm more often than in the patent realm. Okay, very interesting. So Gaby, now I know you've done a lot of work with biotech and life sciences companies. And so maybe you could give us a sense of how it's different in, in terms of approach to IP traditionally for in, in the biotech life sciences area. Sure, thanks George. And that was really interesting, uh, Jason, uh, that description. So with biotech companies, um, especially, I, I think I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the larger biotech companies, just to give you a sense of the scale of IP that we're talking about. Um, let's say it's a uh, antibody therapeutic, a monoclonal antibody therapeutic, you know, typical biologic. Um, the amount of IP, IP protection that you can obtain is vast. I mean, we're talking hundreds of patents. So you may be wondering, well, what, what are these hundreds of patents directed to? And basically with a biologic, you have different layers. The first layers are typically uh, patenting the nucleic acid sequences of portions of you know, the antibody or the entire antibody. Um, there might also be the, the amino acid sequences can also be patented. Um, most of these obviously are engineered and, and created in the laboratories so that are not naturally occurring, which is why you can get IP on these. The expression vectors can be, 
can also be patented with different, uh, you know, enhancers or other regulatory elements. You can imagine how many different variations of that you can get. Um, then, of course, there's just the standard formulation patents. And typically, biologics are administered uh, parentarily, like by um, IV. Um, so that gives you even more ability to get patents because you can claim the formulation very, very narrowly for, for an IV uh, product. And it's extremely difficult for a competitor to get around it because the FDA will not let you make a lot of changes to that formulation if it's an IV versus a tablet, you know, oral dosage form. So you can have another series of different complexities of patents and claims to the formulation aspect. Then there could be dosing and regimens as well. Then there's the methods of treatment, of course, you know, method treating cancer. Then there's a method of treating colon cancer, there's a method of treating sarcoma, it's like all those different layers. But then the bulk of it, I would say, is the culturing and the manufacturing methods because biologics are intrinsically difficult to manufacture. There's so many, there's upstream, there's downstream, there's, there's just so much that goes into it. And you have also the large scale versus the smaller scale productions. You know, there's bioreactors involved sometimes, there's viral particles sometimes, there's all kinds of ways. So, and, and just getting to the specific expression in a specific cell with the specific glycosylation patterns, you know, it takes different buffers, temperatures. I mean, a whole host of things. A lot of that is trade secret because it's very, very difficult to figure it out. So, uh, but still a lot of these bigger companies patent every possible aspect of the process that they can patent without giving away the secret sauce. And there's ways to do that. So certain parts are still kept trade secret that are difficult to figure out, but sort of the more general steps, so to speak, the bigger picture of the process, those are still patented. And I have worked on matters, both on the innovator side of things where I try to get patents uh, for, my, for my biotech clients, but also on the generic challenger side of things. I do both sides where I have had situations where there is literally 500 manufacturing patents you have to go through to try to figure out what might apply in addition to all the other patents. So you can imagine it's a, it's a very, and it's, and the reason, which is sort of what Jason was talking about is because for a biologic, you're talking about a very long term, this product is on the market for a long time. Mm -hmm. So you want to protect that estate as best you can, because we're talking 20 years, we're talking billions of dollars. Um, uh, which is the distinction between certain other areas where, um, where you know, the product is, is around for two years and then it's on to the next best thing. So this is, I think, the bigger uh, picture and how biotech companies usually approach it. Okay, well, thank you so much to both of you for those uh, very detailed answers and just to kind of big picture. So what I'm gathering is that they're in the food sector, even though in both of these two different areas, there is a mix of patent and trade secrets, you tend to have more reliance on trade secrets in the food industry and somewhat more reliance on, on the patents in the biotech industry, but you know, definitely some overlap. Um, so David, I was wanting to see if you could give us a sense of sort of, uh, we look at these two different traditional companies, you know, or I mean, we're not, not when we're sort of blending the two, but you know, biotech on the one hand versus food on the other. So if you give us a sense of sort of the culture of invention in each of these two areas and sort, you know, sort of who are doing, who's doing the inventing and what is motivating them kind of in the two different areas. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks, George. It's interesting, Jason and, and uh, Gabby set up a, a kind of good uh, kind of here's Here's how it is on one side, and here and 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 uh, here how it is, and here is how it is on the other side. You know, from my perspective, uh, what we see a lot of, especially today. Again, we won't talk about the convergence yet, but what we're kind of seeing today, the convergence is is is, is happening. But what we're seeing today is that most of these inventors today, whether they're you know a startup food company or even a startup kind of biochem company. Mm. Most of them are definitely in, are scientists. They are researchers. They are, you know, classic inventors that are probably at a university or something like that. And, you know, part of the tech transfer of a university. 
Um, for sure, we are definitely seeing inventors also that, you know, on the, on the food side that are just regular people that are coming up with, you know, amazing formulations. They might still even be calling them recipes at this point in time, right? But they're coming up with, you know, interesting methods and probably maybe working with universities to kind of figure out the food science behind it to see if there's anything that they could possibly get some sort of protection on. So I think it's a lot of, from, from, from I, I think from all of our perspectives, it's PhDs, it's researchers, it's scientists, it's universities. When they start to spin off different companies, the, the people that are leading those companies are the scientists that are that are part of that university and part of their tech transfer program. And then on the other side, you have the kind of foodpreneurs that are out there that may or may not have science backgrounds, but again, are looking to try to see what type of intellectual property or you know kind of strategy they should have whether it's patent or, 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 or actual trade secret. But I think the convergence has happened and I think we should definitely you know, spend some time on what, so what happens now? Here we are in this you know, kind of overlapping space of food meets life science. And it's, a, it's become a real question for companies for sure, which is what route do I go? Do, do, I, do I go the patent route? Do I go the trade secret route? There's all these external factors trying, trying to affect their decision for sure. Um, and, and, then, and, then, and then when you throw in the, the, the part of, you know, uh, uh, trying to, you know, solve the world's problems as well, right? Like trying to create, you know, you know, uh, uh, reduce animal cruelty, or you know, uh, potentially, you know, save the animals so that so that so that we can come up with alternative sustainable proteins. That throws an entire new mix into it, the life science mix into it. So um, interesting, uh, interesting when these two things converge, and I think that's where you know that's where not only the action happens, but I think where the investors are probably most interested in as well. Okay, well, thanks. I think that gives us some really useful context. And so, kind of just mo moving on to that idea that you've uh, sort of, that you um, raised in part of your answer. The so now that we have this blending that's taking place, so um, I would go to Jason on this. So, what would you say um, is sort of what are the implications? So, what um, what is that? Uh, what would be um, in terms of how, how we're, we're going to obviously have to adjust the approach to IP somehow, given that we're, we have this, this sort of new territory that's merging two different areas. And what would you suggest in terms of what some of the implications are for IP strategy? Yeah, and I think David led into this uh, a lot in terms of the fact that the, the, the core innovators in the space are researchers, um, as opposed to in the food industry where it's not necessarily like that all the time probably because the barrier from a techno technological standpoint is much lower on, on, on your, your legacy food industry versus biotech where the educational requirements and the lab requirements and all that are much higher. So really the, the convergence is, is, is cultural in a way. And this is why, uh, again, leading off of what David is saying, I uh, was talking about a lot of this is research based, it's universities based, it's research institute based, right? So you're really starting out with biotech research. Fundamentally, that's the category it sits in. And what does that mean? It's very publication heavy. Um, it is very public disclosure heavy. And so as a result, you're really entering this as a bio, I think for the large part as a biotech sort of entity or a biotech research base, which means that you're gonna very likely disclose a lot more uh, by virtue of the fact that researchers need to publish. Uh, and so you have that factor on one side. You also have on, on one side in the biotech sphere, um, it, it, you're really, it, it's a how versus what question. In, in biotech, you care about what is happening with your drug or biologic, pharmaceutical or whatever, or your diagnostic, what it's doing, but it's essential to understand why it's working the way it is. So it, it, it's the how, not necessarily just the what. In the food industry, obviously there are health concerns and whatnot, but with ingredient labels, you get an idea of, you know, sort of how much fat and what the cholesterol is and all those things. So the how isn't as important in the food industry. It's just the what, does it taste good? Is it gonna kill me? Really is very simple. So it's a what question in the food industry. So you're coming into the food industry from a how regime. 
And so that's where this convergence happens. You're going to be coming in from a from, from a lot of uh, researchers that are very much into the publication, very much into the how, entering into a food industry where it's only really concerned with the what. And so uh, in my opinion, where I think this is going to lead is you're gonna have heavy filing, particularly on the patent side early, particularly when this starts out as a research project or starts out on the research side. When you spin out and you spin this into an actual company, in reality, you're a food company. You're operating in the food industry, though the majority of what you're doing from a scientific standpoint is purely biotech. It's bioreactors. It's biomanufacturing is really what it is. You're just growing, you're just growing meat cells inside of a bioreactor. Uh, and so you're really a biotech company operating inside the food industry, which means you're probably going to file a lot early. You're going to be licensing in IP, but eventually you're going to have to morph into a little bit more quieter philosophy of trying to maintain a little bit more secrecy because of the potential exclusivity link that you're going to have, that, which is indeterminate. But if you have a very successful product, can go far beyond the patent term, particularly if you know that your composition is going to be extremely difficult to reverse engineer. And there are ways to do that that food industry, food companies have been doing for decades where they would, will, will take groups of ingredients and then combine them into a, a specific, you know, like sort of uh, sub ingredient or a combination of ingredient called something else. So then on the ingredient line, they don't have to report everything. There are ways around this to maintain the secrecy of your overall composition. So I think it's going to morph, George. It's going to start as more of a biotech focus. You're publishing a lot. You want to be able to do all that. But then when you turn into a commercial entity, then you're going to have to morph your philosophy to more of a, a I, I believe, a food industry based philosophy and approach. Okay, that, very interesting. So um, without getting into too much at this point on the disclosure issue and how to handle that vis-a-vis -vis patent applications. So I got some questions on that in a moment. Um, David, since you first raised the issue of sort of what the implications are, if, if I go back to you and see, do you have any anything else to add in terms of, we're just focusing on the types of IP that are most likely to be relevant, you know, at this stage for the the two, for this, this merged area and just as a general standpoint, how they might approach IP. Do you have any further thoughts? Yeah, I, I think um, I kind of want to echo a little bit what Jason was saying. I think it's in really important as, you know, kind of IP attorneys that when we are counseling these types of companies that are kind of entering this convergence, that they kind of know what all their options are, right? That they know that they, and, and potentially what the risks are, which we'll talk about in a second when we get to public disclosures, but, that, but, but it's almost important to kind of be nimble enough to adapt multiple strategies here. So possibly starting out with a trade secret strategy, but jumping to a patent strategy, possibly looking into, you know, kind of other forms of intellectual property, like trademarks or something like that. I think it really depends on the type of alternative protein that they're probably working on and the methodology, as well as the resources available to them. Some of these companies, the ones that are not necessarily scientists and research-based and tech transfer, but are just, you know, possibly outside of that realm, they may not even have the resources to really get into the experimental and data of what they're trying to protect. So that might influence their decision as to what type of intellectual property to protect at this stage, right? M meaning that that early stage. So, you know, there's, there's not that there's not that many choices for sure here. But, uh, but, but I think, uh, but I think having some sort of you know, kind of nimble approach where you can kind of weave in and out. Again, that can be a little bit treacherous as well, but you can do it right for sure. That That is really important to this entire journey. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. So it's clear that, I mean, obviously trade secret and patent are both very important. Um, now, given this, this biotech element to some of these products, like when we're talking about, for example, um, cultivated meat or fish or whatever, um, or, or we have, for example, some of the, the products of plant-based burgers, you have things like heme that have been bioengineered and so on. So there's clearly going to be a major biotech element that we're going to need a lot of pat reliance on patents. Um, now, um, Gaby, you wrote an article called High Stakes um, with spelled S-T-E-A-S. <laughs> and uh, so High Stakes, IP Trends in the Cultured Meat Industry. And one of the things you pointed out was that it, it, there's all, been all these patents being filed in this area, um, but that the average patent in this area is turned down twice before it's accepted, and which I thought was a really interesting observation. I was wondering, could you give us a sense of, of why that is? 
Yeah, thanks, George. So actually, the reason that we made that statement was because it was actually surprising. It was surprising that it was relatively easy to get through the patent office. Two rejections is not a bad thing. <laughs> you know, sometimes she goes through rounds and rounds and rounds and rounds, especially in a crowded field. Now, it's not that it's such a crowded field uh, in one sense, but in the other sense, I mean, it's similar, the way these patents are drafted and claimed are very similar in that they're modified stem cell combinations with specific ingredients, you know, with bioreactors, as Jason was saying, they're all very similar. Um, so I think the reason why some of these patents are actually getting through the patent office faster than I would have expected is because the claims are fairly narrowly tailored to the specific combination of stem cells and, you know, other excipients that go into it, which is good in, on one sense and bad on the other in that you can design around a narrower claim relatively more easily than you can around the broader claim. But for patentability purposes, you can get a narrower claim through the patent office generally faster than a broader claim. Um, and because, you know, a lot of these companies that are, that are mentioned in, in the paper, you know, they have either, for example, some are focused on cattle cells, some focus on pig cells, fish cells. Um, they're all different types of stem cells and there's different stem cell combinations, which makes them unique uh, in that sense. They're not found in nature so that you can actually get a patent because mm -hmm. these are naturally occurring stem cells, but the mm -hmm. combination is unique. Um, and so I think that's why we're seeing, you know, relatively uh, easy prosecution and patents uh, emerging here. So one of the observations that you made was that, um, you're, that you've seen somewhat higher rates of acceptance for those focusing on methods of manufacture as opposed to things like, you know, different combinations or, or modifications of cells. Um, can you give us a sense why that is? So yeah, so I think the reason why that is because the methods of manufacturing, as I alluded to a little bit earlier with, with sort of biologics, you know, they're very specific steps, you know, specific temperatures and buffers and, uh, you know, sugars and other things that go into the manufacture. Um, and those are typically, that combination is quite unique, right? Because the company has figured out how to mass produce something in the most efficient manner with the most activity or whatever else the, the, the parameters are. Um, uh, and that combination is what's so unique. So they typically have some sort of uh, unexpected results maybe, or some good data to show compared to what was already known. This is our combination is unique. And when you can present that to the patent examiners at the patent office, you typically can convince them uh, more likely than not you know, to, to get you a patent because the patent examiners do not have the availability of laboratories. They cannot contest what you're saying. This is what we got, this is the data. So they have to accept it pretty much, uh, especially if it's a declaration that you add to it filed by, you know, a, a, not, a person who's not affiliated with the company. So it's an independent neutral expert that provides uh, the additional uh, opinion that this is unique uh, and special. Hey, thanks. Well, as a follow-up to you, Gaby, um, so uh, I, I understand that, uh, I mean, based on what we just talked about, clearly sometimes different aspects of the manufacturing process can be patentable, uh, but oftentimes companies choose to keep that information secret. Um, you know, if they think that they'll be able to keep it secret, it won't be able to be possible to, to reverse engineer it. Um, but can you see potential advantages to obtaining a patent for at least some portion of the manufacturing process and when might that be? Yeah, so typically the portions that you would still want to get a pan on are those portions that are very difficult to avoid if you're a competitor. So there's certain steps that you pretty much have to follow. Um, you know, the broader, the broader manufacturing steps that you can patent without providing too many details or claiming too many details in those steps. Uh, and certain parts of the process are are virtually the same for every person who wants to go through and make make a bio you know a biologic or a, a product like this. So those are the parts that you try to patent to give you some more protection. And then those parts that are really really difficult and tricky to figure out, those you try to keep trade secret. It doesn't always work, but I have seen it play out. Like I said earlier, where you know upstream downstream processes and everything else 
you know, 500, 400 plus patents, and it provides a really formidable patent thicket to, to get through, um, uh, not, not all by the same company sometimes, you know, different parties are trying to patent different portions uh, of, of, of the processes, um, but it, it provides a very, very, uh, you know, um, relevant and important part of the IP estate, um, which is not always uh, the case. Like for example, for small molecules in contrast, you know, when it's just a, a small molecule drug, you know, there's, there are almost always also methods of making this drug, right? Uh, whatever it is, you know, whatever small molecule, your favorite small molecule. And those are not as complicated. I mean, you got to put the steps in, but a lot of times you can design around those, um, those methods of manufacture. And you won't see as many, you might see 20 patents on methods of manufacture, but almost always there's a way, I'm, I'm generalizing, I shouldn't generalize, but often, there's a way to tweak one step in the process and get around those patents. So that's in contrast to these more complicated uh, biologics. And then also in this industry with, with, with uh, you know, stem cells and bioreactors. Okay, great. Uh, so David or Jason, do, do either of you have any other thoughts on this whole issue of sort of deciding how to divide up different components of, of the product or the process that might be appropriate for trade secret versus pa uh, patent? I think my only comment is that, um, you know, when a company tries to protect the, the resulting product by patent, but is trying to also potentially keep the methodology trade secret or vice versa, that can sometimes get a little bit difficult because the exact, um, how to say it, like during the examination process of let's say the actual product, the examiner, the patent examiner, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, they may actually need that exact piece of information as to of your method as to how you created your product. And that, and then so, and so then, then you're kind of faced then with the decision, well, if I really want this patent, do I really have to reveal my method? I just try to keep the trade secret. And so then you're kind of faced with this idea of like, do I add this new matter in? Do I file another patent application or do I file this kind of evidence or in the form of a declaration, but it kind of reveals my trade secret. So sometimes those things don't work well so nicely together, like trying to kind of do this bifurcated approach sometimes ends up being the exact reason why you have to bring them together again so that you end up getting the patent. And, 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 and the company has to make this value decision as to whether that's worth it or not. And that's happening a lot. That is definitely happening a lot. I mean, you, you, we, we are definitely seeing narrow patents for sure on you know, uh, cell-based protein, stuff like that. Um, but if you want it a little bit broader, you're probably gonna have to disclose more than you anticipated. And again, that decision to disclose more than you anticipated might be the might be the difference between you getting an investor on board or something like that. So it's not all doom and gloom at the end of the day, um, but it is something I think again a company has to you know kind of understand that okay I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try to keep this trade secret I'm gonna just try to get a patent on the actual product but that certain facts might be relevant to the examination and ultimately you getting the patent. And that, that might be what, what you're trying to keep trade secret. Yeah. Um, I, would just, I would just add that uh, a lot of this conversation uh, informs why an IP strategy is necessary before you <laughs> execute an IP strategy. Um, right. And the, the, the ready fire aim approach doesn't work. It, answering a, a David's questions when you're in the middle of it, in the middle of prosecution two years in, isn't the time to be asking those questions and not dealing with those. You have to anticipate those. So consequently, your attorney and the company have to work together to what I say, develop a hood line and say, look, this is where our hood line is going to be. Everything underneath the hoods, we're, we're going to aim to add, be, keep his trade secret. Understanding that and understanding the risk that that provides in terms of providing the the, the, the soft blanket of ammo to get your patents that, uh, on stuff that's above the line is going to inform what sort of effort you need to put into putting that application together as robustly as possible because you're not going to have access to what's below that line. You've got to know that going in because if you walk back that line in the middle of prosecution, then you throw your entire strategy into disarray. So you have to do your strategy first. And, and this isn't is, is going to go into further discussions about budgeting and about 
uh, cost of, of working with an attorney as a startup company, putting a strategy together is a lot cheaper than writing a patent application. And it's much more effective, particularly from an investor standpoint, giving them an 18 month, two year window of what IP needs are going to be in a budget. doesn't take that much time. If you have an experienced attorney writing those applications are going to cost money period. And so your strategy can have actually more value and more legs for you and actually helps answer a lot of these questions up front so you can execute the right way. Um, I, I think that that is a, that is an essential uh, thing to think about. And then and the other thing to think about as well is that, you know, you are, going to have depending on you know what your product is you're going to have you know fda requirements in, in terms of disclosure requirements on that front too in terms of you know getting your product approved and understanding how that folds into your strategy again getting your strategy and establishing that line with all of these interests is something you have to do early so that you can execute because a lot of these things are going to have to happen concurrently but they can't happen concurrently unless you have an aligned strategy that covers them all. Trying to pick them off one by one or going back and correcting mistakes that you've made already is extremely difficult and costly as opposed to sitting down with a whiteboard and your legal counsel and getting an overall strategy for now and into the future so that executing can be a lot easier. Okay, well, thank you all for those thoughts. And now I'd like to go to a question that, that has come in, which I think is an important one to raise especially given that one of the dimensions we're trying to bring out in this discussion throughout the day is, is the ethics of all of this. Um, now, I think as um, people who represent IP owners, you know, it's easy to sort of be uh, thinking of the value of IP and how it can promote innovation by, you know, incentivize innovation by uh, through the, the, the monopoly rights that it, it can provide. Uh, but the question uh, raises uh, to what extent that's a good idea. So it says, um, if the goal is to expand the market share of alternative proteins generally, uh, is it disadvantageous to obtain patents uh, for unavoidable manufacturing processes? Um, wouldn't overall uh, fewer companies making these products be a disadvantage to the industry as a whole and, and perhaps to you know, access to some of the products? I, I, I can start with that. This is an age old question and it's a very, very fair one. And it's one that's been, it is one that's not unique to alternative proteins. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's unique to any breakthrough technology innovation space. Um, you know, the, the belief, I, I mean, the belief that I have, and obviously a lot, I think a lot of patent attorneys have is that um, the ability to protect your innovation incentivizes innovation. The ability to know that you're going to get, you know, you're going to get payback for the efforts that you've put in um, is what motivates folks to uh, put time into innovation. On the other hand, there is an argument to be said that as an, as an industry whole, we need to be in lockstep to advance the industry. And as, and, as, and as a result, publicly disclosing some of our innovation to help others innovate benefits the entire industry. Um, I, do I do agree that that is true in theory. Um, the question becomes whether or not you're the company that's willing to take that risk. Because what it's going to do is it's potentially going to eat up your market share to the benefit of others. If that is something that you ethically believe is something that you want to do, more power to you. And I think you're, 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 if that is something you communicate to your legal counsel, they will incorporate that into the strategy. Um, but I believe that the safer thing to do is to protect your rights. And if you have an ethical belief that you want others to benefit off of the backs of your efforts, then you can give them a free license to it. But you, you, you're better to have the rights and have the choices to make than forego the rights, publish it, and then, oops, I wish I did. Now that everyone's come in, you know, uh, uh, like sharks and, and, and basically come up with a better mousetrap than I came up with, and now my, my market share has disappeared, I'd rather have the alternative where I have the rights. I have the, I have the opportunity to be purely selfish if I desire to, and I have the opportunity to, you know, hand over or license my rights freely to any folks who want to continue research. Also, this allows you to license those rights for research purposes inside universities and research institutes to advance the technology, but at the same time, not necessarily licensing to other commercial entities that will compete with you. So you can ethically meet a burden by protecting your rights, licensing them to those parties that will advance the industry, but at the same time, not hamstringing yourself by licensing it to folks that are going going after your market. Yeah, I, I, I would just like to add, just to just to kind of put a reminder out there, getting a patent is a choice you make as a company. It's a choice that you have to make from a business perspective, from a moral perspective, from a legal perspective, from an ethical perspective. And so 
to Jason's point, if it's your choice to create something for the benefit of the world and not care who copies it or takes it or license it, great, that we do that. You can totally do that. But if you want to control any of it then and, and control it in the right way to, to, to what Jason was saying, then we, that's the game. That's the game. The, 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 the game is called patents to do that. Um, patents were created, you know, we, we, in 1790, it was the backbone of how America was industrialized. It's in our constitution. And so the, the people that wrote the constitution were not the massive companies of the world. They were poor, hungry people, starving, re escaping religious pro prosecution from England, come to America. We want to build America, share your ideas with us, right? Like, let's, 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 let's make something, let's do something. And you can make a little money from it too. So that, it, so it's not all, it, it's, it, it's, there, there's some amazing reasons that, that don't have to be, you know, twisted in a bad way that can support getting a patent. Um, and I'll add to what David said, if you think about it, arguably trade secrets are, are even more dangerous to an industry because you're not telling anyone anything. What you're getting for a patent is in exchange for telling everybody your secrets, you're getting a monopoly for a certain period of time. You can give up that monopoly anytime by licensing it to everyone in the world if you want to, but at least you have the option not to. But at the same time, you are advancing that industry by publicly disclosing everything. If you, if you go the trade secret route, you're not telling anyone anything. The Oreo cookie industry is not advanced beyond Oreo cookie, period. And that's how Nabisco wanted it, right? And so that's the, that's the alternative. I think patents sit in a nice middle realm, but you do have to pay to play. Yeah, that's exactly, that's exactly, yeah, that was exactly the point I was going to make that Jason made that, you know, you're, this is, this is a good thing. It may not sound like a good thing, but it's actually a good thing when you disclose how you made something and give others a chance to then leapfrog and come up with something better. And then you get better and better and better and different and more creative. And this is why we have this explosion of innovation in countries that have a robust patent system. Um, so it's a good thing. It's better than trade secrets because that, you know, we still don't know what the Coca-Cola recipe is. And mm -hmm. I guess no. we, have people, we, don't, we don't have a whole lot of other ones. <laughs> okay. Well, so one of the, one point that has come up uh, earlier when we we're talking about sort of the culture of inventors and in uh, the biotech realm is the fact that some, and, and now by extension in the sustainable protein space is that so many of these folks have a science background and there's sort of a, um, they feel a professional imperative to publish, okay? And it's sort of a publish or perish type of dynamic. And so I wanna talk about what the implications of this are when it comes to, let's say that they, they, they do wanna seek patent protection or they may. So what, are the, what do they need to be worried about when it comes to um, publishing and what are the potential implications for their their uh, patent protection um, down the road? Um, David, you raise that issue first. So let's go to you on that. Yeah. So I think what's so one. I'm glad we're talking about this because I don't think it's talked about enough, especially in that science, you know, university setting where the culture is publish or perish. Right. You must publish what you're working on and towards your PhD or whatever research project you're working on. And, uh, and, and, and unfortunately, under the current regime of the United States, under, under new uh, law, I think it's only, it's gonna be 10 years on March 16, 2023, we have what's called the America Invents Act which actually has stated that if you have published your work, and now I'm talking directly at the scientists in, and that work at these universities that have to publish, then you will have only one year to potentially file for a patent application on that which you published. And that's not really something that goes appreciated. There are, there are definitely scientists and, you know, people that are studying towards their PhD and, and, and again, they're not really thinking about commercialization and creating a company out of their research. And so they're just looking to publish and, you know, get some, you know, credit and, 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 and it's part of their requirements of, of, of being part of the university structure. They're not even thinking about the whole patent part of it. And, and the problem is there's a lot of publications out there that, 
basically run their course and no patent has been filed. So one, the original, the, the original author of that publication may have effectively given up their patent rights or filing a patent under this new regime, the America Invents Act, which we can talk about a little bit more shortly. But it also means that somebody else, let's say somebody independent that is an inventor that's coming up with something very similar to what that research scientist has published, that publication now, that, that publication that hasn't gone, that hasn't morphed into a patent application in this hypothetical is now the blocker for this other inventor that is seeking to get a patent on something similar. And so publications ha are like a one-two punch. Either you're going to follow up that publication with a patent or it's gonna act as a barrier of entry to someone else, which is a good thing in a way from the author's perspective. But from the next inventor's perspective, it is something that they have to take into consideration. And usually, in, and this is kind of what's happening in this space now, there's a lot of, forget the amount of patents that are being filed. There's a lot of publications that are out there. There's a lot, and some of them are not just from scientists and universities, but like blogs and white papers, there's all sorts of publications that are swarming around that, that we need to know now in terms of like strategy, what Jason was talking about, if somebody comes to, to try to protect an innovation, we're not just looking for prior patents anymore, but under this new regime of the American Invents Act, we're looking for prior publications as well, whether they've morphed into patents as well. So when we do like worldwide patent searches to understand what other patents have been filed prior to your, fi prior to your potential filing date, we're also looking for publications that could potentially stand in your way. If I can find them, the patent office is gonna find them. And if the patent office believes that it existed prior to you, even though you never knew that it existed, that's gonna potentially stand in your way. So when we talk about this convergence, like this is, a, this is, a, this is an issue for sure. Um, the university setting, not all university settings are set up to be tech transfer companies where they're looking to commercialize and monetize the publications and the research of a particular professor. Some are, and so they are hip to that and file for patents, right? They, they, they got it. But some, some universities don't have that culture and people are publishing and then later on finding out, well, wow, it's been like two years since I published. Now I kind of want to, you know, kind of create something out of that. And no, now you're legally blocked because it's been more, because your publication has less, is, is older than a year. And under this new regime, you can file. So from a, from a, from, from a 30,000 foot view, I think it's important that we kind of continue to educate, you know, scientists and researchers that yes, pub, you know, publishing is great, but if you potentially want to protect that in some way, maybe the best course of practice is to file for a patent application first, kind of flip it, right? Cause that's not what, even what they're thinking. But what I'm suggesting is, file for a patent application first and then publish. I don't care, you can publish and you can do whatever you want after that, right? But you have, but, but be, because you filed your patent first, then this clock is not running against you and potentially you're not gonna lose your rights. So it's, uh, we probably have to break it down a little bit more, but that's kind of the, that's kind of where we should start from, I guess. What do you think, Jason? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll <laughs> add to that, that even beyond that, um, there's a spectrum of, absolute novelty requirements around the world right. so in the u.s if you disclose an invention you get a year to file a patent application after that disclosure or offer for sale or whatnot but if you're in europe there's an absolute novelty requirement if you've published a manuscript on on february 28th and you file a patent on march 1st you do not get european rights zero and so and there's a spectrum some some countries have a three-month grace period some have a six some have an, even a nine and then the u.s is on the far end of the spectrum where it's 12 months sure. europe's got zero and so we always operate under the lowest common denominator. If you have any hope at all of achieving any international protection, you have to file something in advance of your publication or a publication of your manuscript or, or whatever a public disclosure it's going to be. And to David's point, you know, what, you know, what does that mean? Well, that means, you know, having to spend money up front. Do you have the money? And, 
And you, there are cheap versions of patent applications you can file, but those come with their own risks. But this is a, a real issue, particularly in, in breakthrough technologies, particularly convergence technologies, whether it be computational biology, digital health, precision medicine, alternative proteins. When, when industries are getting smashed together, it's not industry leaders that are smashing together. It is research, it is startups. It, it, it's those folks that are smashing these technologies together to come up with these new innovations. The big, the big fish are not turning their aircraft carrier that quickly. They're buying up the small companies so they can inorganically grow in these spaces. So the education needs to start at the university and research level to understand that you're setting yourself up for one arm tied behind your back unless you're having these thoughts. And I know the, 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 the feeling of, oh, you know, I'm just researching. You know, I, I get it. In, in this world, I think we all have enough knowledge to know it's not only just research anymore. This is how companies start. And I think we've all seen enough to know particularly if you're in a university setting, you, you've got enough experiences sitting around you seeing how these things have happened. All we need to do is continue to educate to keep this front of mind that, that your IP has to be a thought process before you publish. It, it just has to happen. Okay, um, if I could just sort of pause for a second and try to recap a little bit. We covered a lot and this is all fascinating, but I just wanna kind of um, see if I could summarize some of the points that have been made. So um, we've talked about how a danger of publication is that in America or the United States, that starts a time clock ticking for a year. And so you've got to get, um, you've got to get a patent application on file within a year. We've also talked about a, a special danger in Europe, because even though we have in the United States, what's called relative finality, and where you have its one year grace period um, in, in Europe, they have absolute finality in some other countries as well. Um, so you, at the time you file your, your patent application, there can't have been any prior public disclosures that's going to be considered public uh, prior art. And so you're going to be in big trouble. Um, now, there was also an allusion to the, the fact that one could potentially file a provisional application up front, you know, in advance of the disclosure to protect you. So um, Gabe, if I could have you explain um, what that means. You know, what are we talking about when we say filing a provisional application? What does that look like? How does that avoid the disclosure concern? Sure, yeah, there was a lot covered there. So uh, I, I just wanted to take one step back and talk about the clients that I, uh, that my experience is with that need to publish their research in the first place, which is why you may need to right, get the provisional on file. So typically, um, those are professors, typically, right, that need to publish and are associated with universities. And the sophisticated institutions typically have very elaborate tech transfer offices with a lot of experienced folks who educate constantly the, the, the academ uh, academics to make sure that if there's anything new that they, you know, go through the process, fill in the different forms that they have, talk to someone in tech transfer, and make sure everything is, is covered before they go and disclose it. And the disclosures can come in so many different ways, right? There could be abstracts, there could be posters at a conference. If there's government funding that's requested, some of the grant requests, you know, two pagers are published in Edison. There's just so many ways that you may not even realize that this stuff is going to become public, uh, which will create all these issues. Um, not to mention, you know, clinicaltrials.gov, which it's typically, even in the first phase, there's sometimes disclosure data people don't realize can be harmful, and then the blocks that David mentioned. So, so when a client comes to us, let's say it's a university um, that is fairly sophisticated, um, they almost always will agree to put a provisional in place first, only because I'm in the biopharma space. And as we said, that is a very slow moving area. So there's no need to rush to get a patent because we're going through the regulatory phases and, and all of this other stuff. So we almost always want to slow it down, but we do want to put our stake in the ground. So the provisional ideally would contain all the important parts right away. I have seen a lot of provisionals that are car called cover sheet provisionals where someone takes a publication or an abstract or a two pager just sort of slaps the cover sheet on and files it. And that it's highly unlikely that that's going to give you a whole lot of protection because your claim, whatever you're going to end up claiming at the end of the day, has to have support in that one pager or two pager or abstract, right? So just saying, oh yeah, I filed a provisional, I'm protected, not quite. Um, so the better thing, it, which is when you have enough time to do it, not, you know, you get the call from the client, oh my gee, there's going to be a disclosure tomorrow at this conference, we need to get something on file today. Okay, we'll do the best we can, but you know, there's only so much you can do in eight hours or whatever it is. 
Um, so okay. if you have enough time, what, did you no, have no, no, please. Okay. No, no. So you have, ideally, you have the time. You have at least a week or two weeks before this event is going to happen. You put together provisional, which is almost as good as the non-provisional because you want that date, right? Anything that's incomplete and you have to add disclosure later, you're not going to get that date probably. So that's, our, that's the ideal situation. And of course, you may not have all the data yet, but you can put in prophetic examples that may work in US, not all countries, but you can put in prophetic examples, do additional experiments, you get more data, you can file a second provisional, you can even file a third provisional, as long as you claim priority back to that very first one, that date, and include all the other ones when you file your non-provisional. Does everybody know what provisional, non-provisional is? I'm throwing some words out here, but for the audience, of course. Well, yeah, that's um, what I'm trying to want to clarify. So um, everything you said is very helpful. Um, so you've got so basically a provisional is so it's going to be less detailed than a final, def, you know, definitive application. So it's going to have a, a specification of some sort. It's going to have a description, maybe some drawings, um, but it's not going to have the more formal, detailed claims or an information disclosure statement. Sort of is that, that right? That's or? not exactly what I said. No, no, no. If you have the time, and there is enough information, mm -hmm. enough data to prepare a full blown application, which will, you could almost file as a non-provisional. That would be the ideal provisional. Okay. Because it has all the bells and whistles. You can okay. get that date. That date is just- So then the why key. isn't that considered a disclosure if you're putting all that information out? So the provisional is filed and it's not published. Oh. It is okay. confidential with the parents for the full year. Nobody knows it exists except the folks filing it. And so you have one year to then file your non-provisional or a PCT, which is the worldwide application that you could file, or you can, you can file both, or you could just file a PCT with the World Intellectual Property Organization. If you file what we call the PCT, you don't need to file the US case just yet. You can wait another 18 months when you are required to then say to WIPO, these are all the countries I wanna enter into, including the US, very expensive process, by the way, you, you know, Japan, Korea, China, you need translations. There's just a lot of countries in the world. If you want, if you want to file and get protection, in those countries, then is when you enter prosecution in those countries and prosecution starts. Now, when you file the PCT, say a year later, after four months of filing it, it will be published. So, but at least for about 16 months, so 18 months, nobody knows about your application. So it gives you a little headway. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. That's very helpful. So, um, all right. So we've talked about how you can have a disclosure and obviously a, a scholarly journal, um, you know, this, that's going to be included out in the public. Um, and, and you, uh, you are going to a conference and giving a presentation. Um, so what are some other things that could that might not be you know as intuitive that could be, nevertheless be considered a, a public disclosure and let's say for example somebody's trying to court an investor so what are some pitfalls that they would need to worry about uh gave you i think you might be muted i'm not sure um okay you I'm know you're good you're okay, good okay good yeah so this is where the non-disclosure agreements come in when two parties think that they may want to collaborate and have information to share. They typically try to put some sort of agreement in place that would keep what they've disclosed confidential, obviously. Um, but it, it has some pitfalls because, you know, sometimes these agreements are put together by folks who are not quite versed in litigation. And so haven't don't really know how some of these clauses are going to be parsed. And you have to be very specific that you really cover every possible angle in this agreement for it to carry weight, um, you know, and prevent the other party from taking your idea, improving upon it, and then just going off because it's not covered by the agreement because you didn't, you didn't really cover all every part of it that you could. It's of course it's useful to have because at least you can explore with the other party, you know, whether they want to collaborate or, or whatever it may be. Um, and it's almost essential, I would say, if you don't have an agreement in place, good luck, <laughs> because nobody has any duty to keep anything confidential. So you definitely want to at least have an agreement in place, but you still have to be careful. And oftentimes I will advise clients to still get that provisional on pl in place first, then have the discussion, right? So you're still protected. And then if they, you know, have additional data that comes out later, we can always file that second provisional, but we got you covered with that first one. 
it really gives you sort of the framework of what you can actually talk about during those discussions. It really does. It gives you freedom and comfort as a client, as an entity to do it. Um, also understand that when you engage in these types of agreements called co-development collaboration agreements, there are going to be sections of that agreement called background IP, which is the IP you're bringing into the, in, into the, um, into the arrangement, into the collaboration. And what I always advise my clients is fill up that background IP section, meaning get everything on file beforehand. Don't engage in that. It's background IP because it was a separate project that was related to the project. You're going to end up in all kinds of arguments and trouble about who owns what. So you often are given the meets and bounds to create a, a, a category of IP that you own solely that's written into the agreement. And so often this means get it all in file, all up front so that you have the comfort and freedom of knowing you can talk about any of that because you already have a date and you know that it falls under certain clauses of, of, of these types of collaboration agreements. They typically always have protections for both sides and what they've already previously protected. Yeah. yeah. I'll just say just just real briefly, like to mm -hmm. just to echo everybody's point. I think the lesson here, I don't care what type of company, inventor, whatever you are, is if you can get your provisional on file, then you can scream it from the top of the hills. You can talk to anyone, even without non-disclosure agreements, right? Because that is your line in the sand. Anything that happens after that is suspect to potentially your filing date. And so I wish it was that easy though, right? It's never that easy, right? They're like, usually the client will come to you with already a website up. They've already like talked to this person, that person. They talk to their best friend. You know, they talk, they talk to their like, you know, you know, rich uncle, whatever the situation is. And so sometimes you got to put things back in the bag if you could. <laughs> sometimes for sure, yeah. Okay, so let's let's look at things from the perspective of startups. Okay, and we have you know people that may not have a whole lot of sophistication in the le legally, um, and but they've got this great idea and they're thinking about how to. We need investors, and we need to uh, maybe start. They're conscious they have to start thinking about IP enforcement and and um, or securing the IP. Um, so, David, uh, so. And I know you've worked with a lot of, of startups and, and served as a mentor with, with different uh, groups like Big Idea Ventures and FoodX and so on. So um, what advice would you give sustainable protein startups, you know, as sort of approaching this issue and, and beyond sort of the, the pitfalls we've already flagged? What would be kind of your general advice to how to approach IP at this early stage? Yeah, so usually I'll just give you some kind of anecdotal story. So um, I work with Big Idea Ventures, which is a plant-based uh, uh, accelerator. We launch uh, 24 companies a year in uh, the United States, Singapore, and Paris. Most of them are startups. Most of them are, you know, ex-scientists from universities or just, you know, uh, entrepreneurs with amazing ideas that kind of team up with food scientists and whatnot, you know, kind of getting back to that, getting back to that convergence. And usually the, just so you know, the accelerator is a venture backed uh, uh, program. And so from and basically I'm representing the accelerator, you know, the, the actual investor to make sure that the company that's coming through really has all their ducks in a row. And usually we, the, the intellectual property element of it is the number one first and foremost conversation that we are having with these companies because a lot of them have never been educated. Like I, intellectual property is not really taught in high school or college or, you know, like, yes, maybe in university setting, but like entrepreneurs are not really getting the proper education about this. So we are usually hitting them hard and fast and really taking a look at like everything they've done up until the point that they're coming through the accelerator and seeing what rights they've given up and what rights they can possibly get, when to shut their mouth, how to shut their mouth, like all, all, all of that. So I think, you know, uh, for, for, for all those kind of future entrepreneurs out there, even for the lawyers that are going to be, you know, kind of representing those startups, from my, from, from, from my perspective, the biggest thing is that, that, that I think they have to understand is education and empowerment, right? Like they need to not only understand how to organize themselves from a corporate perspective, but really get a handle on their IP strategy as early as possible, 
Like it's so much more important than figuring out how to try to get lab space to conduct the experiments that might prove what they're trying to do. Like they really need to understand how to kind of establish this long-term, you know, game plan. Right. So yeah, I think there's a lot of other things, um, but um, I'll let others talk. Now. Okay, so, so um, thank you for that. Now, um, Gaby, so um, could you give us a sense of from a um, how doing taking the advice that, that David has described as far as um, you know paying attention to IP, securing IP, whatever would be appropriate under the circumstances, how that can impact the startup's prospects with regard to um, investors? Um, I would say almost 100% of the time, if you don't have any IP to show to an investor, not even a provisional, they're not, generally not interested because they, they want to know that this is actually patentable. Um, they want to know that there's going to be this window 20 years or 17 years or whatever it may be, you know, depending on how long prosecution takes, that they're going to invest in something that, that they can defend. Uh, and unless it's sort of a, like a, you know, computer science slash biologic slash, you know, um, uh, type of invention, you know, maybe it's an app, it has like a bio component to it or a medical component to it. That's, that's different from sort of the straight up biopharma or sustainable protein or whatever. Those you generally want to protect and you want to get a patent because they're generally reverse engineerable. Um, and so even if it's just a provisional that you have on file, I have had so many situations, especially with startups, that as long as they were able to show that they had provisionals on file uh, and were able to you know, provide the, the applications, sometimes they don't, but they, to be able to provide that, they were able to get the, the investment necessary because that is that hurdle. It's that sort of that magic, magical step that you, uh, you have to overcome. So um, very, very rarely would I say, would I advise a client not to file anything? And again, it would have to be the Coca-Cola thing. Uh, okay. Because with all the technology these days, a lot of, a lot is reverse engineerable. Okay, great. Well, so, um, so Jason, to go to you. So let's imagine you're in a situation where the startup has been educated. They've gone out, they've filed their provisional or got some other, uh, IP that's going to be impressive to an investor. So can you give us a sense of what maybe are some pitfalls that they could run into in dealing with those investors? You know, they're going to, so this investor is probably going to be asking for some equity in the company and you know, how do they approach that and decide, you know, um, how much they should give them and what could be the consequences if they give too much, you know, any other guidance that you could offer for dealing with that situation? Yeah. I mean, I think from an investor standpoint, in terms of, you know, how much equity you need to give to the investor, there's a lot of, you know, there, there, there's some pretty standard calculate calculus around that. And that's really going to be not that that's going to be pretty difficult to avoid. Um, I think more so the concern has to be in the early stages is how much of your equity pool are you giving um, to uh, uh, board members? or board advisors, or uh, those other folks that come on to support the founders early in the early stages, because that can eat into the equity that would be set for investors down the road. So I think that's one thing you wanna keep in mind, particularly where you're a new company and you're wanting to get a big name on your board or get a big name on your advisor board. And sometimes you can fall into the trap of giving too much equity to, to get that. So when you, when, you, when you go through building your team, particularly those around you, those adults in the room to help support you, and having an idea of what your walk away is, having an idea of how far you're willing to go to secure those, you know, th th that, that, that support, uh, while not hamstringing you going into to speaking with investors. I think when it comes to the investors, uh, having, a, you know, a, as an angel or a seed, it's not as important when you get into like series A, having a good lead investor is important because that lead investor will help bring on secondary investors, but also that lead investor will stay on and support further rounds. So looking for a good lead investor is going to be extremely important. Um, and in terms of from the IP perspective, I agree with everybody, but everybody had to say, um, if you can file, having a filing, particularly in a food industry is important. Uh, and particularly given the fact that a lot of this is going to be biomanufacturing based or bioproduction bio based. So it, it's important to have uh, something protected as long as you've, you've discussed it. But at the, on the other hand, having an IP strategy that's definable and communicable to uh, the investor because it's two non-lawyers in the room talking IP, being able to communicate that, understanding it well enough to educate your investor um, is, 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 is influential. Uh, it does make uh, your uh, investor, I think, more comfortable. And then filing smartly. 
ha having a raw number of filings that only the invest the, the, all the investor has to say is oh, what are these covering and how much did it cost you because there, there there's the other end of the spectrum where if you overfile they're going to think that your money the money's getting blown and not being used a smart way so there's a balance between not filing at all and filing too much and that's all built around ip strategy because if you have an ip strategy you can communicate then whatever you filed should map, should map to that and then you give you give that sophistication as a young company that a lot of other young companies uh, don't don't you know at the have, and so it gives you a competitive advantage. Um, and and a couple other things. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I think uh, a lot of uh, startups get roped into a discussion is understanding that investors, you know, quite frankly, no offense to anybody on the call, aren't brilliant when it comes to law. And so they're running off a checklist. And sometimes you'll be, you'll go into a seed round or Series A round. Those they're like, have you done an FTO yet? Have you landscaped yet? Those are five, six figure costs to do. And so I would just encourage startups to, to not fall into the trap of having to answer these questions. You answer the questions with education. Why am I going to do an FTO on a product I haven't finalized yet? And then I'm going to have to turn around and do it once I do finalize it. And why am I doing an FTO to identify patents that I could be problematic when I don't have any revenue for them to sue against? I mean, there are things that you as, as a company need to be educated on so you can educate your investors. Because I think often investors just sort of go through the run of the mill questions without really realizing the implications. And what do you do as an investor? I mean, as a company, is you're, you're scared into spending for those things. So you can answer those questions and you put yourself behind the eight ball. Okay. So a lot of great points there. Um, number of different pitfalls that startups can face with investors. Um, among, among them, the fact that you need to attract some investors, some you know, lead investors is going to help you get others. You can't give them too much because then that's going to maybe scare off other investors and uh, hurt yourself down the road. Um, and then also um, making sure that you're smart about what uh, demands they might make um, that, that may not be necessary. So, um, David, I, I'll go to you on this. Um, so we've talked about the sort of from the perspective of startups vis-a-vis -vis investors, but now let's flip things and let's look from the perspective of the investors. So can you give us a sense of how they approach um, what is their perspective on IP when they're looking at um, a startup? And I mean, we've already gotten a sense that obviously it's going to be important to them, but and how might they go about doing due diligence? And, you know, just in general, how might they view things differently from startups? Yeah, you know, I think those early stage investors, at least the ones that I work with, are probably more in line with what Jason was talking about. They're pretty realistic, Right. They know that the company might just have a provisional and they know that that is a long way from getting a granted patent. So that is it's important. Don't get me wrong. But I think you're also looking and we've heard you probably have heard this before. They're looking for a team. That's one thing. Right. These like, you know, uh, folks or entrepreneurs or founders that think they can do it all. That usually doesn't cut it, right? You need to, like, you're not going to be the ex. If you're the scientist, you are definitely not the expert in business, right? If you're, if, if, if you are the business dev guy, then you don't know nothing about science. And so you've got to, so, but yet, but so you need to kind of build your team and, and kind of build out all of the attributes that would make you attractable to an investor. I think also these early stage investors are, looking for the, what also kind of what Jason was saying, which is a really good point. Like what is the potential for filing, let's say like in another country or like potential, like, like as an example, like some investors want the ability to file in Europe. And so part of their due diligence will be, well, you made a public disclosure, you know, the European markets out, we just happen to have a great strategic partner that happens to be based in Holland. And so we're not going to invest in you because you, that your application will likely not be able to go into, in, into Europe. And so I think those that are a little bit savvy, they're definitely not lawyers, right? For sure. But some of them that are a little bit savvy that really understand that this company is, is taking baby steps, but they want to be around for the future steps. That's really important. I think the, from my perspective, active investors, and I, and I heard this on the, on the previous panel, somebody had said, um, you know, just investors know when a company's desperate for money, right? They just know it. And that's not really the most sound, the, the most sound investment. At the same time, you definitely want that investor 
building on that, you want that investors that's going to be active with you, especially when you're an early stage company. Who are they going to introduce you to? Who are the potential partners they know? If, who, who, you know what, what gates are they opening for you, right? Who else are they introducing you to? Like that's that like that type of active investor, I think can go a long way for, 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 for a company. So those are the ones that I try to work with, right? Those ones that kind of get everything that we're talking about, not the ones that think they get it. Like to Jason's point that are requesting that exactly to do, to do a $50,000 FTO on, on, on a provisional patent when you don't even know what you have, right? Like that's uh, uh, completely out of the realm of, um, of, of being rational, you know? <laughs> so. Well, um, so I want to, I want to he hear insights from the others as well on this, but I want to just pause for a moment and just tell the audience that we're, so we're approaching, getting toward the end and it's time for any further Q and A. If anybody has any questions, now would be the time to put them in the Q and A box and um, our panelists will be happy to, uh, to answer them. Um, so pending uh, further questions that may be coming in here momentarily, um, I would just um, ask if, if either uh, Gaby or Jason, do you have anything to add on what we were just talking about? Um, I, I have something to add, maybe sort of that hasn't been tackled yet, but you know, as we're running out of time, wanted to bring it up. In the food industry, trademarks are extremely important. Brand is extremely important. Product packaging is extremely important. Often products get bought based upon how attractive the packaging looks. How attractive does that food look on the package? Because you're not going to see it until you buy it. And so trademarks and trade dress are extremely important. In biotech, not so much. A little bit, you know, you have, you know, you may have, you may have a, you may have an industrial design for a group of QPCR systems that have the similar sort of name that's catchy in the, in the, in, in the, in the stratosphere. And so you definitely, you get trademarks around that, but it is nowhere near how it is in the food industry. The name of your company has got to pop. The name of the product's got to pop. The color and the images on the, on the packaging got to pop, all that stuff matters. And so when you are doing truly biotech work in the food industry and you're a, and you're a molecular biologist or biochemist, you're in the food industry. And so you cannot lose sight of brand. It's going to be essential. There could be a inferior product to you that outperforms you because of the way they brand. So that's something you definitely have to keep in mind. I don't, I don't want that to be lost. And I also, well, I also wanted to bring up the fact that when it comes to innovation and convergence spaces, convergence spaces typically don't innovate inside large companies. We talk about sort of the, the combination of disparate technologies like tech and biotech for, for bio, computational biology or for food and biotech here. You require two different types of cultures coming together to form a new one. What that means is, uh, you know, a, a, a large company like Genentech that has reams and reams of biomanufacturing and, and whatnot going on there, they're going to need infrastructure to pivot into building a food company. They're not going to do it. If they're interested in the industry, they're just going to buy tech. They're going to inorganically grow by startups. And it, so that when it comes to convergence tech, you're typically going to not get that aircraft carrier to shift inside a large company. You're not going to get a company where it's synthetic biologists determining the next molecule, molecular target for decades and decades. And then all of a sudden, because of the advent of AI and machine learning, that, that your innovation immediately is going to pivot to a bunch of kids with Beats headphones dealing with millions and millions of data sets, right? And that's how they can develop. It's not going to happen that quickly. So with large entities, it's really, the innovation is going to come inside universities, research institutes, and small companies. So that's something I just want startups to realize is that the interest is going to be inbound into these companies where they're looking to partner with you and perhaps even acquire you eventually if they want to get into the space because the infrastructure lift to get into that space in capital investment in these large companies, it doesn't, it's not pre-existing. It's often not pre-existing. A food industry does not like craft foods does not have bioreactors laying around. Yeah, they just don't. So if they want to get into the space, they're going to have to make massive capital investment, hire a lot of people in to even do this. There's no synergy inside a, a, one of these one of these entities and on either side of this industry to hit this convergence space, which is why startups and research is where a lot of this innovation is happening. Can I add on to sure, that, George? please. So I agree with Jason that in the uh, biotech space, especially, you know, we're talking a Umera or one of these incredible cancer, cancer drugs, nobody really cares about the trade dress or the trademark. This thing is, you know, sold to hospitals, the patients are dying, they're getting the drug. I agree, but in the pharmaceutical space, yeah. 
Trade, trademarks, the trade, this is huge important. Why we the blue pill, the purple pill, the whatever pill, and, you know, the pink bis, bismol, and so on. Uh, so there, it's definitely also incredibly important. And one last thing I wanted to say about what, that, which I don't think I mentioned earlier, is about sort of the the uh, catch twenty two that a startup finds themselves in because you know we the lawyers are telling them you really want to try to get as good a provisional on file as you can, and they don't have the budget. They don't have the re they don't have the capital yet, but they know that they have to get on something on file. But they just they only have enough money to put something quickly on file. So it's always mm -hmm. that where we try to counsel them, you know, don't do all these other things, just try to get this one good patent application on file, which is going to give you all this other value, but it is tough, tough for startups. Oh, I will add to what Gabby said that the, that if you, if you look at the long game, the amount of money it costs to file a patent application is nowhere near what the cost to prosecute it. I mean, it's a del I mean, it's 10x, 20x more expensive to get patents in multiple countries than it is to prepare the patent application to begin with. And the extra effort you put into preparing a robust patent, patent application up front is going to save you money down the road because you're not going to end up going six, seven rounds with the patent office because you have a limited disclosure to work with. You have so little ammunition. The more robust and more effort you put up front is going to save you money downstream. So you got to look at this as, as a long game. So one, one danger that startups have at the beginning, we're talking about how they, they lack resources and they're not needing to prioritize. So one concern would be uh, that, so they develop a, a product and then um, it, is, it looks great in the lab, but then we need to scale up for mass production. And so there's gonna be a whole new set of technology that's gonna need to be developed for that uh, potentially. And so um, one pitfall a company could face would be if they decide to partner with somebody else, right? They reach out and they say, okay, there's somebody else that has existing manufacturing capability. We're going to partner with them uh, have a, uh, and they're going to handle that. But then now there's a risk that, that whoever helps them with that ends up having to claim on part of the IP that's critical to this product, right? So this, for example, happened with, with uh, Beyond Meat called Savage River at the time that they contract with Don Lee Farms to do the, the scale up manufacturing. And then there was a, a uh, after it went big, the product, there was a, a legal battle over who owns the, the IP associated with the scale of manufacturing. So what would be, um, for any of you, what would be your advice in dealing with this, this type of situation where you have a company that might have these real constraints, uh, but they also need to try to protect their IP for the long term? Um, I'll, I'll start, uh, if that's fine. Um, so the reality is if you're a startup looking to manufacture, you're going to need a co-man because you're not going to have the capital to build it yourself most of the time. Sometimes sometimes maybe you're a revenue generator early and you can reinvest your own revenue into manufacturing and the capital necessary, but often you're going to use a co-man. So these contracts will have to be negotiated. A couple of the, the, couple of the hints that I give to, uh, to you know, my clients as they're negotiating uh, with, with a co-manufacturer, particularly when they have to develop the manufacturing process, it's not like they're using a pre-existing manufacturing process to, to make their product, that they're together collaborating to build a new one using you know, background IP that both are bringing to the table and what they're going to develop together. Number one is you're not, you don't negotiate with one entity. Um, if you negotiate with one entity, then your walkaways, you'll, you will crawl back your walkaways because of the necessity to engage with that party. You try to look for multiple potential parties. That way, you're not desperate for one. And that way, when you establish what your walkaways are, you're less likely to crawl back. So, for example, if you're a small, small company that needs to get a set of samples from Pfizer, from Pfizer, and you're negotiating with Pfizer, and they start to realize that you need them more than they need you, it's going to affect your ability to negotiate for the terms you want. So how you artificially avoid that is have a couple of candidates that you're looking to collaborate with and work together with them and see which, and see which one is willing to sort of offer terms that are commensurate with what you want. And with the, the second thing that I, I, I just initially introduced is walkaways. You cannot go into these types of discussions without knowing what you won't, what you will and won't do. Because if you don't do that, you will end up moving the needle throughout negotiation, particularly when you're in an experience, you're dealing with maybe larger, more sophisticated, more experienced entities, you're going to end up, you're going to end up sort of walking back your own sort of what you presume to be your walkways, unless you define them with your lawyer, you both understand it, you both discuss them. That is it. You need that before you go into that. It is absolutely going to be a point of negotiation. Not what you're bringing. That's why the background IP is so important. Getting as much as you can underneath the wire so that while you're talking about what gets developed there, a lot of times it has to do with who's paying what. If you're paying them 
for the services of collaborating together to build this, then, then it's a quid pro quo. What am I getting back for what I'm paying for? Um, often they're gonna, obviously they're, they're, their argument's going to be, look, if you take my, if, if you own this and you can take what I've helped you develop and go to my competitor and do this instead, what I tend to argue is I think the risk is bigger for me that you take our technology and you utilize it to, to help Coman for a, for a competitor of mine. I think that's actually a bigger risk because it's my entire business model. Whereas I'm just one client of yours. You have multiple clients for which you're working with. So for example, if you think there's a risk that I'm going to take our innovation and go walk down the street, so you lose one client, you do that to me, you destroy my entire business. So th that's the sort of negotiation I would do to say, argue for those rights moving towards the, um, you, you know, the entity that is engaging with the co-man, not the co-man itself. Yeah, I, I would, this, this, is a, this is a pretty tough situation to navigate for a small company, for sure. Hopefully, they're talking to trusted sources at this point, too. Hopefully, they're talking to referrals from their investors as to who can be their co-man. And, 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 and to Jason's point, you need to go into this as a company of like, I'm bringing this opportunity to you right? This is my intellectual property and it must be protected at all costs. So they have to come in with that mindset. It can't be this desperation of like, oh my God, I, I can't really figure this out and I got to just give it all up, you know, in order to figure this out. They have to come to the table with that negotiating power. They've come that far. So it should be, hopefully they're, you know, standing strong at that point, you know? The only thing I would add is that whatever agreements are in place, the intellectual property provisions in the agreement are super critical, obviously. And this is where some, some startups may forego getting a patent attorney to look at those IP provisions to make sure that there is a clear delineation, you know, who brings what, as Jason said earlier, but also if there's co-invention, who owns what, who does it need to be assigned to, because there's inventorship and then there's ownership. And those two things are separate and distinct and, and need to be spelled out in the agreements. And there could also be antitrust limitations to what exactly types of provisions you could have in there in terms of um, grant back clauses and so on and what, what may be permissible with uh, um, that could be considered against public policy because of discouraging innovation. You know, and so there, um, there could be any number of different pitfalls in the drafting of how you go about those provisions. Um, okay, well, we're, we're getting just about to the end of our time. Does it, we have a couple of minutes left. Does anybody have any, um, any final thoughts? They would I just share? To, yeah, I want to just touch on something that Jason said about, uh, about uh, trademarks. You know, these are most of these uh, alternative protein, cell-based protein biotechs are, are literally sitting on the shelves of food stores, right? And so to Jason's point, they are living and dying by their brand. And they will likely have protection over their trademark way before they're even thinking about like what's happening with their patent. So to just to, to, to drive that point home, because trademarks is a phenomenal source of, a phenomenal type of intellectual property, that's something that cannot go unstrategized for sure. You know, you can be the, you can have the most amazing technology, but if your name sucks or is confusingly similar to another, co another company, like something as simple as that, that can throw everything that we're talking about into disarray. Your investment could be uh, up in the air. You know, you can be facing, you know, potential trademark infringement issues. Like, so you don't want to get into that space. So thinking about the brand as early as you're thinking about filing the provisional, I would recommend that. For sure. Okay, well, I think we're going to have to end there. It's been a fascinating discussion. I know that I've learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience has as well. And uh, very grateful to have had such um, such accomplished and knowledgeable panelists who agreed to be here with us today. And um, so, for the audience, uh, we're going to end this panel now, and we're going to take a one hour break. So we will resume at 1:30. It's it's lunchtime. Perhaps time for some sustainable protein. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, George. Take care. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye, Bye everybody.